So we continue with more talks by our doctoral students, the ESRs. The next one is Bowen Fenn from ETH Zurich. I'm his advisor, and Bowen will talk about uh, his work on predicting recovery from multiple organ uh, dysfunction in uh, pediatric sepsis patients. Bowen, the floor is okay. yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And as Carson said, uh, my name is Paul Van. I'm an uh, ESR2 and from the Department of Biosystem Science and Engineering, Engineering from EDH, EDH Zurich. I started in the first March of 2020, and, and this work is uh, one of our recent work that has, has been published in ISMB 2020 this year. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say thank you for all these collaborators, as this project is a joint project between ETH Zurich and also some clinical institute. That's uh, interesting. Oh no, sorry. It's a University Hospital Upper and Anna Roba H. Dury Children's Hospital of Chicago and also University Children's Hospital of Zurich. And it's not possible to get this work done without their full support. So I'd like to say thank you here. So there are two main focuses of our project. The first one is a pediatric sepsis. And I would like to give you a proper definition of what a sepsis is. And Sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. And this uh, sepsis can progress ra ra uh, rapidly that leads to severe organ damage and death. And also on the right-hand side, you can see a fact sheet of sepsis, which is from the World Sepsis Day event. And from the fact sheet, you can see uh, there's uh, 47 to 50 million cases per year and at least 11 million deaths per year. And in uh, one in five deaths worldwide is associated with sepsis. And also sepsis is number one cause of death in the hospital and number one cause of uh, hospital readmission and also number one cause of the healthcare. And up to 50% of the sepsis survivors suffer from long-term uh, physical or psychological effects. And also what's even worse is that sepsis is disproportionately affects children as 40% uh, of the sepsis cases are children under five years old. So that's why uh, pediatric sepsis definitely worth our additional attention. And the second focus I would like to say is uh, the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, short as MOTS. And MOTS is defined as two or more concurrent organ dysfunctions. And MOTS is highly likely to be developed from sepsis in pediatric patients. And comparing to uh, regular sepsis cases, a mouse has even increasing morbidity and mortality. And here in this study, we use the organ dysfunction definition from the International Pediatric Sepsis Consensus Conference. And this definition includes six different uh, major organ systems, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, central nervous, uh, renal, haptic, and hematological systems. And for those patients who exhibit mouse at the sepsis onset, uh, it's much less likely for them to recover to a rather mild state like zero or single organ dysfunction, through, even those through treatment. And even for those who survive the mouse, they may still suffer from lifelong consequences to patients, uh, to themselves and also their families. So here uh, in this study, for those patients in, uh, who were already in mouse when requiring sepsis, it's important to investigate their chance to uh, recover to a better state like zero or single organ dysfunction. And here, this is also this, uh, the main motivation behind our study, that we do an early prediction of the recovery from mouse in these pediatric patients with sepsis. And hopefully with this work, we could uh, provide the clinicians the opportunity to, to take extra care and also enable timely interventions. And so here we employ some machine learning models for this prediction. And although there are already many studies that have focused on the, the early recognition of sepsis, but this uh, prediction, early prediction of the mouse recovery in sepsis patient has never been attempted with machine learning. And also the current standard of care in clinic practice is still rule-based. So with this effort, with this work, we hopefully develop something, a uh, framework, which could, could allow for personalized prognostics for those patients uh, with uh, pediatric patients with sepsis. So this work is mainly developed on the Swiss Pediatric Sepsis uh, Study, short as SPSS. And this uh, SPSS is a retrospective national and multicenter cohort study, including children up to 17 years old with blood, uh, blood culture-proven bacterial infection. 
and involves 10 major pediatric hospitals in Switzerland. And this SPSS database includes uh, electronic health records at a daily level, which uh, keep track of the most abnormal measurements within every 24 hours. And this record presents up to six days of uh, blood culture sampling, or what we call the day of sepsis, uh, the day of uh, the sepsis onset. And a recent systematic review shows that for the early prediction of sepsis, more than 85% of the study only validate their, their models on one single database using a cross-validation scheme. And even though their, their models performed quite well in their own settings, uh, the perform performance were never really verified in the other database. And also for this clinical research, external validation is extremely important for, the, uh, for assessing this model's generalizability. So that's why we managed to assess to another pediatric uh, sepsis patient database from Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, short as uh, LCHC here. Uh, that's for the purpose of external validation. So let's have a proper, look, uh, proper definition of this uh, MOS recovery. So we formulate this as a binary classification task that uh, on the first day, uh, we predict the patient using the data on, uh, from the first day of sepsis onset with a time horizon of seven days. Here I show a few examples of the MOS recovery. And day zero here is in, indicates the day of sepsis onset, and we have the data until day six. So that's a one week, and we do the prediction on day six. And here the blue arrow indicates the mod state, and red arrow indicates the mod free state. So the first one is a recovery example that the patient was in the mod, was in mods, and after day three, he or she got better, and eventually on day six, uh, he or she was mod free. And the second one is a non-recovery example that's the, the patient started with mods and got better for, after day two, but eventually turned into mods again. And the third one was uh, excluded because the mod, uh, the pa even the, uh, uh, the patient started with mods free. So that's, that's not what we consider in this study. And also one thing to note is that uh, if the patient deceased before day six, we still, uh, deceased before day six, we still consider the patient is, uh, is a non-recovery. So after re uh, removing those invalid samples for the SPSS data set, we have a non-recovery samples of 138 and recovery samples are 118. That translates to a positive class prevalence of 46.1%. And for the other external validation set, we have a non-recovery example of 210 and recovery example of 181. That has a very similar positive class prevalence and also the cohort size is more or less similar in the same order of magnitude. And with the help of the clinicians, we also collected some relevant uh, variables for this prediction task that includes uh, vital science, laboratory test results, clinical scores, chronic disorder information, and also demographics. There's 44 of them in total. And the data are only collected on the first day of sepsis onset uh, without the risk of a future information leakage. And here is the results here. We, uh, for the internal validation that we implemented and compared to several machine learning models, including a logistic regression, support vector machine, random forest, multi-layer perceptron, and lag gradient boosting machine. And also we implement the uh, clinical baseline model that using the decision tree which, with the second pediatric logistic organ dysfunction score, which this score has uh, been verified to be a very good indicator of uh, mortality and also organ dysfunction in large pediatric uh, patient database. So uh, we also adopted a nested cross-validation scheme that we split the data into training validation and test that. And we repeat this for in 10 independent rounds. And with the model development and the hyperparameter tuning was done on the training and validation set. And we only report the performance on test set only. And on the right hand side, you can see the internal validation results. Here we use two metrics, uh, area on the rock curve and area on the precision curve. So all five models, the five main, main machine learning models performs comparably well and up. All of them are from the clinical baseline model by a large margin. And what the winner of this five model is actually the random forest model where with a AUROC of 79.1%, AUROC of 73.6%. That's why we chose the random forest model as our main model and for the later external validation. 
And also the random forest model is a highly nonlinear model and tend to be overfit and not doesn't really generalize very well. So it's particularly important to do a external validation for this random forest model here. Then we do this external validation. Actually for the completeness of the study, we did this validation uh, in both centers and also tested on the other. So here you see two plots and the red curves with the uncertainty bands are the internal validation results of, for the 10 tenfold cross validation. And the blue curves are the external validation results. That means the model was trained on one center and tested on the other. So basically we can see that uh, the generalization of this random forest model is quite good, successful in both directions with this uh, area on the rock curve uh, over 75% for all the cases. And also the area on the precision curve is over 70% with the positive class prevalence of around 46%. And also if we look at the high recall region, where it's the, of more uh, clinical interest, that most of the, uh, the events can be captured. Can be captured. Uh, for example, if you look at recall at 80%, that means uh, four out of five recovery events can be correctly predicted. And we still have a precision score around 60%. 60%. That means uh, for every five uh, predictions, the model made, hmm? sorry, three of them are, are correct. So we see this random forest model here have both high uh, prediction performance and also high generalizability in terms of this, uh, oh, sorry. in terms of this most recovery prediction task. Thanks. And later we also, analysis whether the random forest model can predict the most recovery earlier than one week, like one, one to five days in advance. So here we show the uh, results of, of the relative AU, AU, AUPRC area on the precision recall curve uh, for different time points. The relative AUPRC is the absolute AUPRC normalized by the positive class prevalence on each date. That using this matrix, we could have a rather fair comparison of different time points. So the, uh, we developed a random forest model on the SPSS data set and evaluate them on both. So you see the record for the SPSS data set, the performance keep going down as we increasing the, uh, the time horizon. And for this uh, LCHC data set external validation, we see the performance goes up a bit in the first two days and then uh, drops from the day three onwards. And on day six, uh, both external validation and internal validation are, uh, achieved very similar performance. And also this as a, uh, is something we will be expected as uh, for a shorter horizon, we should have a better performance. And also for, uh, for the temporal limitation of the data sets, we could only do the prediction for the first week but for like longer horizon, like two or three weeks, we could probably just expect a, a bit lower performance here. And, but MOTS here, MOTS here in, in the pa uh, pediatric sepsis patients, they are, uh, MOTS is a highly dynamic disease that usually with the progression or the recovery scene within very few, uh, for the first few days of the admission. So, and also the persistence of MOTS uh, for, the, for a whole week is already a, a a better sign that's highly associated with uh, mo high modality and mo mobility. And also we wanna have a model that is, have a, a both high prediction performance and also high generalizability. So that's why we chose day six as our main focus. And also another thing we desire is the high interpretability of the model. So that's why we chose to use this shape values to, to explain the risk factors discovered by this uh, random forest model here. Uh, I already lost count how many times you have seen this. So hopefully you're not get too tired of that. So anyway, so on the left-hand side, you see a beast one plot uh, showing the top 10 features here. And on the right-hand side, you see the full names of these two uh, ten, uh, top, top 10 features and the right-hand side is the, top ten, the full names of them. And how do you interpret this beast one plot? That basically each dot is represent, uh, represents uh, each uh, patient and also the red dot indicates a higher value of the feature and blue dot indicated lower value of the feature. 
And the closer of the dot to the right-hand side of the x-axis, that means the feature is driving the model to give you a positive prediction. And the, the closer to the left-hand side, that means the feature is driving the model to give you a negative prediction. So for example, if we look at the top one, the lowest ox oxygen saturation level, that means the, here, there's a lot of red dots here. That means the, the patients uh, uh, with high oxygen satur saturation level, the, the model tends to assign them high chance to, for the recovery. While for the second one, the lactate, and we see that the, the red dots on, are located on the left-hand side of, on the, on the x-axis, X -axis. and usually that means heightened lactate values already indicating there's organ damage going on. So that's why the model uh, thinks that its patients are not going to recover from us. And for, well, uh, for this part, what we found interesting is that we found two organ systems. The cardiovascular and respiratory systems are critical for this mod's recovery prediction because we find this top 10 features, most of these top 10 features are more or less associated with these two organ systems. So in clinical practice, we could probably pay more attention to mod's patient with these two type of, types of uh, organ dysfunction rather than treating them equally compared to patients with the other types of uh, organ dysfunctions. So finally, I would like to summarize my presentation that here in this study, we developed a machine learning framework for predicting mouse recovery in pediatric sepsis patients for one week in advance. And we conduct a comprehensive experiment to show that uh, the, uh, the proposed model can not only just predict uh, mouse recovery with high accuracy, but also can be transferable across different clinical sites to those unseen patient data. Uh, even in an intercontinental setup. And also the prediction of the model is interpretable from a clinical point of view. So this means the uh, model we developed here could provide uh, more insights to the clinicians or maybe make uh, they are more understandable for them. And also we believe that our model has certain clinical utilities that it could probably assist clinicians for better patient assessment and triage on day zero, uh, the day of sepsis onset. And now we are doing something else uh, using the same data set that we, including the genomics and the uh, proteomics profiles of this patient that we try to discover novel clinical phenotypes of, of pediatric sepsis. And by doing a characterization of the patient subgroups for, uh, hopefully with this effort, we could develop something for better personalized treatment. And that's all for my presentation. If you want to have uh, further information of this paper, you can scan the QR code here. Thanks a lot. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Bowen. Are there questions for Bowen? Tobias. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, thanks, Bon, for the great talk. Uh, one question regarding the clinical interpretability mm. that you mentioned in the end. So uh, how would this look like? Is that these, these graphs that you show, or is there more mm? behind it? So how would the clinician interpret the results? Uh, I think this will be probably help to help uh, to support their decisions like Patient with, like, for example, low oxygen saturation or like high lactate value, they should pay more attention to that. Or but, maybe, all right. Yeah, but it's probably if you have a certain uh, patient, right? It's um, most probably the case that there will be certain points which will be on the blue, others on the red, right? So otherwise, it would be a clear decision. So if I I, I get it if I see a patient oh, see. and it's it's always in the red, then it's clear and I can see also yeah. as a clinician. Um, yeah, how the system comes to it. Yeah, we system. also actually provide some examples for like how model, how the model like make the uh, prediction for each individual samples. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm not here. Here, it's in the paper already. So it's like a survival score for each individual patient. Uh, that will be much easier interpretable. I think not in the cohort level, but individual level. Did, did you have many more features? Then you said these are the top ten features. Yeah, this top ten. We have forty four features in total. Okay, and um, did you also like 
quantify like how much each feature kind of contributes to the solution? Do, do, do you say like with these 10 features, I capture pretty much, I don't know, 99%? Or... Oh yeah, we actually, I think we didn't really quantify like how much exactly this top 10 contribute to the model history, uh, the, the prediction. I think that's a good point that we could probably include this in future work. But, but you said it's the first two, right, that have the highest... I only uh, talk about this first two here, to, just to showcase like how this model like, take uh, these features into account when they're make, making prediction. Hmm. To... Overall, if you look at the hmm. resulting performance of the system, right, hmm. you could already show that basically it doesn't matter which machine learning method you yeah. use, but it's always better than the, the clinical, like, clinical yeah. state of yeah, the that's art, right? right? But, but yeah. do, do you think there's a way to push the performance much further? Because there was not, at least not from the first view, there was not so significant differences between the yeah. individual methods, right? So, yeah, that's right, that's right. And, yeah, and performance is, well, it's below 0.8, right? So it's, it's, it's not super reliable. Yeah, do, it's, do you it's think there's a way to push it further? Or? I think, yeah, of course, for machine learning models, the primary way will always be to have more data. So this for this uh, pediatric sepsis patients, we only have like a cover size of less than 300, which is a pretty little for this data-driven approaches. Mm. Yeah, probably if possible, we could include more data, but it could be very difficult. Or we do a more exhaustive grid search, but it could be also this could lead to some overfitting issues. Okay, thanks okay. a lot. Um, Leslie. Thank you, Reid Kock. Um, I have a question on slide 11. Could mm -hmm. you explain again the, so you trained on the SPSS, mm -hmm. and could you explain again why the, the Chicago data for the relative AU PRC first increases and then decreases? Yeah. Or what's the interpretation of that? Mm, it's a little bit difficult to interpret this. Or it's kind of a mystery of, of yeah. why that phenomenon happens. Yeah, we didn't really try to interpret this at, at the beginning. So just because it's an external validation and we couldn't really access to the data and we just let, pass the model and let it run. So if yeah. anyone could give a proper guess of why this is happening. It's an interesting artifact then. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Bowen, I have one, one question. Um, so we always took for granted in this project that, mm -hmm. the, the, that the sepsis had been confirmed mm -hmm. as a bacterial yeah. infection. Is this actually known at the point of time in which we would make our prediction? Uh, so, there's, there's an, so in other words, there's an inclusion criterion for this data set, which where it's for me not totally clear that this is like given or determined is the right word, that this is determined at the time at which we, we make this prediction. So the... Is this the bacterial infection? Do you know at which time point this is typically confirmed? Is it maybe three days into the stay or something? Yeah, that's the, the things that the, for this data set, it's actually that we use the blood culture to prove an, uh, prove an bacterial infection. That we do the blood culture resampling, and we once we found the bacteria, we make this as a day. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the inclusion criterion of the Swiss pediatric sepsis study. Mm -hmm. um, but I think an open point is when exactly is this determined? Is this maybe determined after we make our prediction? Because then there would be another like latent set of patients on which we could also make our predictions, mm -hmm. but uh, which do not fulfill this inclusion criteria. Do, do you want to? Yeah. I think that would be an extremely interesting external validation question to test the model on patients who are at risk for developing sepsis, for example, mm -hmm. and see whether your model will predict them to recover, basically, because their recovery likelihood will be higher, I guess, because it's not uncertain yet 
whether they have sepsis or not. So are there data sets like that available? This is the question. Right? Maybe I can answer. So there's now a national data stream for pediatric uh, research in, in Switzerland, in fact, um, and headed by one of our collaborators on, on the paper. So they are going to collect data sets like that, like in intensive care data sets for, for children, for pediatric patients. And there you could do this. I mean, what, what this data set here represents is, is a very clean data set in the mm -hmm. sense that, that the sepsis, sepsis has really been confirmed to be connected to a bacterial infection here on these data sets. It's not, not necessarily the case for all things, uh -huh. or for all patients that are labeled as septic in, the, in, a, in a database. Yeah. And then, then exactly it's the question, how, how much does this then generalize if you train on a, mm -hmm. on a high quality, yeah, a expensive to obtain labels? Yeah. Dian, and then uh, do you want to? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if this uh, Swiss pediatric uh, sepsis data set is public. Uh, so far, it's not officially ah, okay. for the, some privacy issues. Yeah. Okay. And also, the external validation is also not accessible to public. Okay. Yeah, we wish to, to uh, even not, not to us. <laughs> Maybe just as an additional comment, what you said is extremely important because if we think about the translational perspective of, of your modeling mm -hmm. efforts, these models tend to be applied as, the, as we go to more poorly defined samples. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it's crucially important to establish this right away because to determine what the operational window of these models is. Another idea that came to my mind is, have you looked into decision curve analysis to establish the value of your model? So basically doing net benefit analysis, how much do a clinician gain or a patient gain from a certain prediction? So by taking in the, the costs and the opportunities basically of a prediction. Yeah, I think for this one, it's actually a retrospective study. So it's a bit difficult to evaluate to really compare against like clinical clinician decisions. So hopefully we can do some prospective study like really put this into clinical practice and we see really compare to like the true decision made by the clinicians as this clinical baseline is still something a proxy to those. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Paul, and it was a great presentation. I was just thanks. wondering um, because you were talking about how you had to basically hand in the model and get mm -hmm. the predictions back and you mm -hmm. couldn't have access to the data yeah. when doing this external validation. Uh, could, it be, could this be a nice use case for something like federated learning or swarm learning that we had presented in the network like yeah. early on? Like uh, maybe using something like that, you can collect data from multiple sites. And Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, in this case, it was extremely difficult for us to like to communicate and everything for the model development and also evaluation. If we could like, do this anonymously using the federal learning, I think that will be very useful. And for, for also for the other collaborations in medical field. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you a lot. But if I may add, this project was interesting in the sense that for us, this was the, really the first example of what you could call federated learning. So we sent the models to, yeah, to the did. US and they ran the model there. So, so in all our other projects, we negotiate data access at some point we get several data sets and then we harmonize them and then we run it this this was really done decentralized so we only sent the code yeah. we, did, we never got the, the, data. the us data yeah. in this project good oh, still one so it's time for more questions that's one minute so i guess who was first uh, uh, i'll start in the back yeah Um, do you know if there is any stratification in your in your sample, especially regarding the kind of uh, bacterial strain that um, causes sepsis? Um, sorry, I, I didn't really get it. Um, you... Do you know if there is maybe an effect, like like a strain specific effect, uh -huh. in terms of like the features that you can yeah, that you get from your patient that could have an impact on the performance of your model in the end? Can maybe maybe I can... help you to interpret this. So whether we could stratify for the type ah, of bacterial infect infection that is uh, present. Oh, yeah. So we also thought about this, actually, but due to the very limited cohort size, we didn't do this eventually for the subgroup analysis or any stratification of patient or based on whatever the side infection or the yeah. pathogens. So, no, no. Would, so, uh, no, we didn't use those as features because uh, 
this may not be available for this external validation set. I'm coordinating the adult sepsis study in Switzerland, and we looked into this point very much. But the case numbers are too small to to uh, stratify for the type of bacterial infection for the for the pathogen that causes sepsis. So in in a in a like realistic time horizon, so uh, like a bigger like collection of data sets is needed than just a, a Swiss one. Juliana. Uh, with Mike, with Mike. So I mean, as Bone said. The, the size of the data set did not allow us to stratify, but what we did do is like look for enrichments of certain, like statistical enrichment of certain strains in, for example, the like false positives or false negatives, just to see whether for some strains the, the model was like struggling more than for others, but we didn't find anything like exceptional. Thank you. And final question by Giovanni. Thank you both for the talk. I have a small curiosity also in addition to my question. Apologies if I missed it, but mm -hmm. why is the rate of sepsis so much higher in children? Like, is it because of the immune system that's not yeah, fully developed? More immune system and also they're more vulnerable in general. I see. Um, so my question is, uh, since as somebody else mentioned, the model is not like 100% reliable, mm -hmm. um, where is the situation in which you will, you would get some predictions wrong? And in the clinical setting, not all errors are made equal. In this case, would it be worse to get like a false positive or a false negative? Like what would be the consequences of both? I like, think, yeah, in this case, I think that's a very good question. In this case, we're doing the recovery prediction, not like usually mortality prediction. So I would say it's, Better to give a false negative, since so we consider we still like pay attention. These negative examples, right? We still pay attention to these patients because the models think that this patient will not recover. But hopefully, if the patient eventually recovered, it, that will be good. But if not, we can still have more additional attention on them. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you again, Bowen, and uh, we move on to the next speaker. Thanks.